Are you ready for the weekend yet? We have events, news, and a guest for you to enjoy this Lake Life weekend. Hello and welcome to another episode of our Lake Life Weekend podcast. Yeah, stay tuned, please. We have a great interview partner here, um, Brand Alcott from the Pelican River Watershed District, talking about uh, shoreline protection and giving all kinds of insights on um, plans and uh, how they support uh, any of your projects. So stay tuned for that. And oof, I am still exhausted from this past weekend. Um, it was uh, in the 70s and uh, I spoke about uh, sunscreen and uh, we used it, but still, I think we got sunburned. Um, it's really nice, really strong. Um, if you haven't put your boat in yet or your dock, let me tell you, I put our boat in. I, I shared with you, I have a 1977 Checkmate and um, yeah, we drove it to the public access. Um, it fired up. Uh, we let it warm up a little bit. It's an old engine and um, we took off and then the motor went out. It was um, yeah, 10 minutes pedaling back to the access and um, it fired up again and warmed up a little bit more. And then I thought, let's just give it another try. And yeah, we got further and it went off again. And I really don't know what um, to say. It, it never did that before. If you have some tips, um, I think the gas line, hopefully the gas, gas line is just uh, clogged. So we pedaled in the middle of the lake. Um, we are one of those guys pedaling with a boat and um, the wind, I was hoping the wind brings us over to, to our beach um, all the way across the lake from the public access. Um, it fired up again. Um, another boat was approaching us, but when it fired up, uh, it left and uh, 10 seconds later it was dead again. So they came, rescued us and pulled us to our lift. And um, yeah, thank you that. My son was really excited. He says like, well, the good thing about that was we made a new friend on the lake. And that's true. <laughs> thank you, Mike, uh, for rescuing us there in the middle of the lake. Uh, that was quite an experience. And um, yeah, well, um, one of our highlights for sure. If you have tips uh, for my old checkmate, uh, feel free to email me at hello at lakelifeweekend.com. Another really nice thing we did, um, and uh, another neighbor friend here, um, they have horses. And uh, we went to a horse boarding place southeast of Frazee. I think it was uh, Shandy's, uh, no, um, Sandy's Oaks. Um, I believe that's what it was called. It was beautiful. They had. They had a, a clinic there that today and there were like, I don't know, 30 horses uh, with horse riders and it was really nice to see. I, I love horses and um, I hope to actually get her in for an interview sometime too because Lake Life also is um, horses, I would say. So that was nice. Um, we had a packed weekend. Uh, I put the canopy on our boat lift, uh, fixed some boards and um, Harry has a little pirate boat so we let that swim and um, I also said if you go in I will go in and uh, the, the water was really cold um, he went in and I had to go in and uh, <laughs> so our first swim in May um, I think I lasted uh, four seconds maybe four and a half but that was good so yeah more weekend fun to come this this whole week is going to be really nice out and uh, I hope that the water will uh, a warm up soon so we can enjoy swimming or we will just take the canoe. I don't know how soon I'll be able to fix my boat, but yep. I, somebody told me a story one once. What is it called? This, um, when you own a boat, I don't know. It has always something to fix and, um, I hope it will last, uh, another summer here. Yeah. Upcoming events. Uh, this weekend is mother's day. So mother's day weekend, um, um, really some some nice uh, um, um, events. Uh, I think Fairhills has a brunch. Um, the Holiday Inn has a brunch. Um, so if you don't have a really beautiful uh, lunch brunch at home, you can take mom out. Um, here in Lakes Country is a lot, a lot to explore. I, I know that. Um, some other news coming up. Um, that's interesting uh, voting for the new casino uh, and hotel um, at Cass Lake 
Cast Lake. Oh, that's not the one at um, Star Lake. Okay. Oh, interesting. The vote for Leech Lake tribal members will take place Tuesday, May 16th. That's another week out, though, to decide whether the reservation should construct a new 45 million to 50 million palace, casino, and hotel. Meetings have already been held on the reservation and also in Minneapolis and Duluth. Ballots were sent in the mail to eligible voters already in April. So, yeah, interesting facts. Um, um, we have some more uh, places coming up here, possibly. So stay tuned. Um, you can find all news uh, on that on our website, too, lakelifeweekend.com, and uh, follow up. Um, yeah, here some other things. Uh, Minnesota DNR offers resource for lakeshore improvements. That's, that's another resource that I can highly recommend. Um, now that spring is here, many lakeshore property owners are planning their next yard project. Property owners have a significant impact of the health of wildlife and the water based on how to manicure their lawn for the season. The Minnesota DNR offers online tools such as Score Your Shore and Restore Your Shore for landowners to use to implement when evaluating their property and planning their next project. Uh, you can find it all at uh, www dnr.state.mn.us slash ryS. You'll find a link on our uh, website too. So if you want to educate yourself uh, on the DNR um, resources and then also later you will hear about um, the Pelican uh, River Watershed District and their resources for your projects. Um, some events. Um, Homestead History, May 11th. History Museum of East Auditor County in uh, North Perm, Keith Butler will take about the history of homesteading in Minnesota at the History Museum of East Auditor County in Perm. Um, that's already Thursday. Um, it's a nice local event, uh, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then um, if you want to hear some music again, Josh Turner is at the Shooting Star Casino on Friday, May 12th, 8 to 9.30 p.m. Shooting Star Casino in Minoman. John Turner will be performing at Children Star uh, Casino. Ticket prices start at 25 for general, 40 for select, uh, 55 for star. I guess that's a VIP pass or something. And then this weekend, yes, walleye fishing opener. The, me the Minnesota walleye fishing opener is May 13th, um, this Saturday. Before you head out on the water, make sure you have an up-to-date fishing license and are familiar with all limits and regulations. This year's possession limit is six combined, not more than one walleye over 20 inch. Well, good luck. Um, and then there's a spring vendor blender and craft show on Saturday, May 13th, um, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Holiday Inn on the lake. The ninth annual spring vendor blender and craft uh, event show will will showcase local artists and crafts at the Holiday Inn, May 13th. Um, all um, current events on our event schedule. So please drive to our website and, and find find information there. Yeah, I don't want to keep you up from this uh, interview, which I thought was really, really nice. So stay tuned. Enjoy. Yeah, hello. Um, Welcome again. I am here with um, Brent Elcott from the Pelican uh, River Watershed District, and he will be talking a little bit about uh, what he's doing, what is what uh, the Watershed District is doing in the area. Uh, welcome, Brent. Thanks for having me. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for coming. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. Um, are you from the area? Did you come to Detroit Lakes? Sure. Um, no, I'm not from the area. I'm a Minnesota native. I grew up in Big Lake. It's a little town northwest of the Twin Cities, about 45 minutes or so. Okay, uh, direction Brainerd? Um, no, it not, not, not quite that far. Yeah, same direction as Brainerd, but yeah. uh, not quite that far. By Elk River. Yeah, okay. It's just north of the Twin Cities, not, not, not too far away. Okay, okay. Um, graduated high school there and then went to college at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. Oh, yeah. where, where I got my degree in biology and minored in chemistry. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So you're coming from the biology background? Yep. And how long have you been with the Pelican River Watershed District here? Oh, in let's Lakes? see. Uh, this fall, it'll be three years. So about two and a half years now. Okay, yeah. okay. And um, what is your role and what does the Watershed District sure. do? Sure. I'm the assistant administrator. Um, my, I've 
a, a few primary jobs, but one of my main ones is the residential and commercial permitting program. The, we have a permitting program that, depending on the type of activity or development that's being um, developed or built, may have a uh, stormwater management requirement, something that you would have to manage the stormwater off of the impervious surfaces to meet the water quality goals to ensure that the water resources aren't degraded. And I'm responsible for administering that program. Okay, well, wait a second. Let's step back. Sure. And uh, I didn't mention, I actually met you... Uh, a little while back at my Rotary Club yep. and then we met again uh, at the Expo earlier this year where you represented and were in touch with with people visiting or living residents uh, from the area um, and so the watershed uh, district serves the counties of yeah let me let, let, let me back, back up, up and, and and just short tell you what my what our range is um, we're about 122 square miles okay so we go from uh, north of Floyd Lake um, in, the, in the agricultural region up by Campbell Creek Yep. That'll be the northern extent of our boundary. And we go just south of Lake Melissa, kind of by the Bucks Mill Dam. Yep. Um, that'll be our north-south area. And then east-west on the west side would be Pearl Lake, that uh, that area there. And then just east of uh, Detroit, uh, Detroit Lake. Okay, okay. So, and there's more watershed districts, right? So you're one of many? How there many? are. Oh, I would have to look. I don't. Okay. I don't know the number of watershed districts off the top of my head. But in this area, it's just us. Um, Cormorant Watershed District is to our west. Buffalo Red and Wild Rice are to our north. Are you a government authority? We are. We are. We're a we're a, a unit of government that's petitioned by the residents. Usually for one of two reasons. One would be flooding or water quantity issues, where if it's prone to flooding. Mm -hmm. The other issue would be water quality. Mm -hmm. Ours is was formed for water quality purposes. Mm -hmm. um, there were some pretty degraded waters uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. The citizens of this area petitioned the state to establish a watershed district. And we were established a little over 50 years ago, about 50 and a half years now. Interesting, so in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, we, we celebrated our 50th anniversary this summer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's right before building code got established. Uh, I think that was 71 on the uh, lakeshore front. Oh, the for, for, for the, um, yep, yep, that? yep. The, the, the shoreland, um, shoreland regulations. Yep. Interesting. So the watershed districts in this area was, so we have a pretty straightforward uh, community back then protecting yeah. Minnesota, protecting yeah, there our... Are, there is some pretty seriously degraded waters, especially Lake Sally uh, was, was really bad back in, the, back in the 60s and has rebounded wonderfully since. Really? But, mm -hmm. So, okay, maybe later you can share a bit of the success stories uh, here. But Absolutely. So we have, you said, uh, 120... 122 two, square miles. Square miles. Of we have 144 lakes. Oh, wow. Within 122 square miles. That's significant. That's a lot of lakes. A lot of yes. lakes. Uh, um, a lot of those are going to be smaller pothole um, natural environment lakes that don't have a whole lot of uh, residential development on them. But we do have quite a few um, res or, uh, highly developed lakes in, in the area too. And when does a resident get in touch with you? Sure. Um, so so there, there would be kind of two different thresholds. Well, I guess three. For, for permits, any activities near the shore within the shore impact zone so for most of the uh, general development lakes that would be 37 and a half feet from the water mm -hmm. so if you're doing any activities in there uh, vegetation removal tree trim or tree removal mm. rip wrap um, if you wanted to put sand along the shoreline around the water that would be something that you would be required to get a hold of me to get the proper permits Okay, so if I uh, uh, improve anything close to the water, yeah, then, yeah, so it's not building a house that that close we cannot build anyways. It's yep, way too close. Yep, thirty-seven and a half feet. Yeah, unless you're grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then okay, and so you get yeah. And uh, the other thing I would like to say too is just because there's a permit requirement, or even if you aren't aren't required to have a permit, I am open to people contacting me to get insight of what works and doesn't work along the shoreline as far as rip wrap or planting ideas. If residents are interested in how they can better use their land mm -hmm. and protect the lake, mm -hmm. um, that's that's what I really enjoy doing too. 
And of course, that's all our goal because we want yeah. to enjoy the the waters as long as we can. Absolutely, and, and that's I mean that's that's the mission of, of of my organization is just to protect and enhance our waters, both rivers and lakes. So, so you work for the residents, uh, finding the best solution to fulfill their project. Exactly. So you don't work against them. You kind of want to say like, okay, if you want to do that, then we could go that by doing this yep okay. exactly and we have a set of rules that are established of what you can and can't do um, based off of a lot of community input when they when they were established uh, we had biologists and hydrologists and um, a lot of people that came together to look at the difference in the type of land and how that would affect the adjacent public resource being the lake mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you mentioned uh, planting and I know that there are some native plants or some significant plants that help absolutely it's all about it's all i mean i really i'm really uneducated sure. compared to you so so everything now to make it easy it's rain water floating into the lake and then how much it takes along yes exactly so so, so what were our major concern that we're trying to stop is phosphorus it's a naturally occurring element and in this area it's the limiting nutrient for our lakes so the exact amount of phosphorus directly correlates to the amount of algal growth or the, the amount of greening, the green algae growth that you'd have in a lake. So the more phosphorus that gets there, the greener the lake becomes. Okay. Um, and if you have enough of it, it becomes nutrient pair, impaired and you could actually have some recreational activities be inhibited. It could produce some algae that causes toxins. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. Um, it produces- Some message? I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, cyano or blue-green algae, um, there was some stories last year and the year before down in the Twin Cities area where they had a lot of impervious surfaces mm. that delivered a lot of stormwater that had high levels of phosphorus in it. That created this blue-green algae um, created a toxin that is pretty damaging to to humans there I think there are some mm. some pets and dogs that actually mm. um, didn't make where's it. the phosphorus coming from from the grass uh, from, from fertilizer um, so it's a naturally occurring element oh. it, it gets picked up in the atmosphere oh. um, it also comes off of fertilizer on lawns um, sediments any sort of uh, sediment gravel has phosphorus that's bound to it mm. um, decomposing plant material can can release phosphorus so it's actually natural we just mm -hmm. need to have yeah. it filtered through the through the dirt yeah so so what happens when you have shoreline development there's always before we were here mm -hmm. there was phosphorus getting into the lake but it was at a natural level mm -hmm. when we when we came here as humans and started building houses and driveways and roads we didn't allow that rainwater to soak into the ground naturally. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is concentrating that stormwater into confined and point outlets into the lake, and we're so and we're, then we're feeding and, it with more exactly, and we're conveying it there at a faster rate, and we're not letting it go over the natural soils to be uh -huh. soaked into the ground, which would filter out the phosphorus. Okay, it would. Okay, it would get stuck in the yeah. Ex a absolutely. So when when you go through the sediments, a lot of the phosphorus would get picked up by by the sediment par particles, and it would get filtered through, just like a like a sand filter or a uh -huh. carbon filter, like you would have for your drinking water. Interesting. It, same same concept with uh, phosphorus and. Okay, sure. And now that actually, because if I am a resident, I don't want a green lake. So so and and certain plants. So. Uh, um, there's solutions where I can stop the rainwater to just float right into the lake. Oh, absolutely. So the beach is actually not mm -hmm. enough, so we need some planting. So um, the, the easiest and biggest impact that you could do as a lakeshore resident is planting a buffer along the edge between the your, your lawn and the lake. What we would plant it with, or what you should plant it with, is a native vegetation that has a really elaborate and extensive root system. So what that does, it helps, it does two things. It helps stabilize the shoreline so you don't have increased erosion, mm -hmm. or either from water or from ice that might push along the shore in the wintertime. The second thing it does is that it prevents stormwater from getting the lake by slowing it down and increasing the amount of infiltration or the rate at which the water soaks into the soils. And then being that it's a native plant and the root structure is so elaborate, it picks those nutrients up for its own growth. So that way it kind of, it's, it's kind of like a sponge. It stops a lot of that phosphorus before it gets to the lake sure. and, and picks it up. A lot of them are really pretty gorgeous, actually. Yeah. Um, there's some plantings that a lot of people do with a lot of wildflowers. So yeah. they, 
Um, I've seen pictures. Yeah, um, really good habitat for butterflies, birds. Yeah, huh. Um, and uh, uh, now that we know what we can do, how many projects a year in the area with your 122 lakes that you said, how many projects do we have a year, applications? How, how, how involved are you? Um, this is the first year that we have actually a program that we are helping fund these these projects. So hmm. there's there's becoming more and more awareness and more and more research that's showing how big of an impact these buffers and these natural protections to the lake have to actually the, you know protecting and enhancing the water quality. So the watershed district this year, the board of managers approved um, a cost share program where we could actually reimburse the cost of the plant material that people would use. So for a residential property, we would reimburse $500 or 75% of what the plant material costs of what it, of, oh, of, of planting a buffer. That's good to know. Um, there's been a lot of interest in it. Um, I've been I've been promoting it pretty heavily and uh, there's been a lot of people that have interest in it and we're, we're getting some applications now already for, for, for this spring season. Yeah, for, for, uh, for the spring, spring and summer season for plantings, yeah. Interesting. So. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, continue. Uh, the other thing that we do is we work pretty closely with the Becker County Soil Water Conservation District. Um, they also have a cost share program where they actually help cover the labor costs associated with the plantings as well, um, whether they do it themselves or you contract with someone else to do it. So when you use those two um, local programs, the cost of the landowner is pretty minimal. Like 25 um, yeah, well, the the cost for the plant material would be they would the, the landowner would only pay twenty five percent of the yep. of the, the plant material, and then the overall project in a lot of cases you could get fifty percent funding for the labor and the plant material from the the soil water conservation district, and then um, that would be used first, and then whatever was the remainder of that yeah. expense for the plant material, that's when the watershed dollars would help kick so in. So significant. So oh, huge, cut in half. huge. Yeah, wow. I mean, projects that are, are really massive shoreline restoration projects are um, cheaper than rip wrapping the shoreline. Interesting. Um, and that's kind of what our goal was, is to give get some alternative solutions to erosion control and promote natural shorelines to help stabilize those shorelines and prevent erosion instead of just doing the the riprap, which isn't always the best solution and could be um, damaging to, to the lake too. Yeah, we'll share later how and get touch Absolutely. with you. Um, and that is also interesting, how to get a hold of the watershed district. Yeah. But, um, so you're growing, um, What what? tell us a little bit about the success story. So you said we had a really stressed Lake Sally. Um, sure. And and what what, reflecting on the history, how, well have you how successful has it been um well you could ask some people on, on like sally too i know i i heard a story that they there were some people that used to mount outboard motors like boat motors on their docks so they could push the floating masses of algae back out into the lake this mm. was this would have been back in the 60s so when the watershed district was established they started looking at different projects and how to control and manage the storm water uh, and that's one of our main goals is managing the storm water off of the roads and impervious surfaces. So they started putting some stormwater management ponds in to reduce the amount of phosphorus that makes it to the lake mm -hmm. and, and filtering that out. The other thing that, that happened was the construction of the wastewater treatment plant in the city of Detroit Lakes. That was one of the major contributors oh. to nutrients coming into the system. Oh, through St. Clair? Exactly. Oh really? Yeah, St. Yeah. Clair's also it carried through. Yep. Well, same. And fed the bacteria. Yeah. So the the, the 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 existing wastewater treatment plant was built in the '70s, I believe. Don't quote me on the exact year, but I think it was the '70s that that was built, and that discharges directly into Lake St. Clair. Yes. Um, now, the nutrients are a lot less now than with the wastewater treatment facility than they were before a wastewater treatment facility. So there was. Oh, on, directly in on, there. on treated water going into Lake St. Clair. Ooh. Now, Lake St. Clair feeds into um, a ditch we call Ditch 14 or St. Clair Creek mm -hmm. that flows from St. Clair and feeds right into the Pelican River, just a hair downstream from uh, where Detroit empties. So, uh, Muskrat? Uh, yep, yep, right, right upstream from Muskrat. So, that flows through Muskrat and then down into South. Oh, yeah, yeah, right there. So, that's where most of the nutrients were coming from mm -hmm. that were impacting Sally so severely. Wow. 
So when the watershed district started putting some of these stormwater management practices on the ground and started controlling some of the stormwater and helped with the wastewater treatment facility being constructed to help treat some of the, the, the wastewater before it was discharged to Lake St. Clair and eventually into Muskrat and Sally, um, that's when we saw a huge change in uh, energy growth or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for the past 40, definitely 30 plus years, there has been a recovery. Oh, and, yeah. And Lake Sally is the most significant success story. Then what, what else happened? Um, so another big project that, that we did was um, Lake St. Clair. We, this would have been a little over 10 years now, 13 years ago now. We did what we call an alum treatment. So we had a, a aluminum salts that were placed in Lake Sally. And what that did was acted like a blanket on the bottom of the lake to stop. Saint Clair or Sally? Uh, I'm sorry, Saint Clair. Yeah. Okay. To stop the phosphorus that was being released from those old sediments. So in the bottom of Lake Saint Clair, there's about 12 feet of unconsolidated sediment that are left over from the old wastewater treatment facility and the lack thereof. Kind of like this, muck. It's yes. It it's, sits down in there. Yep, yep. It's, so it's unconsolidated, and it's it, it has a lot of, uh, I mean, a ton of nutrients in there. It's, it's old wastewater from from the wastewater treatment facility. It just sits down there. Yep. Huh. So it's just it's, it sits on the bottom. Lake Saint or Lake Saint Clair is about seven feet deep at its deepest, and then below that, there's about twelve feet of these unconsolidated sediments that are releasing this this nutrients into the in, into the water throughout uh -huh. throughout the summer months interesting so what we did is placed um a alum or aluminum salts on the bottom to help block the input of those nutrients coming out of those sediments uh -huh. and to kind of capture them and seal them in the bottom of the lake that stopped the amount of nutrients that was coming out of lake, lake st Clair by about half so you put a literally like kind of a blanket over Yeah, there? it's kind of a blanket of chemical that you would put in there and that settles out and it binds to the phosphorus irreversibly. So any phosphorus that is coming up, it binds to it and then clogs and, and it becomes and like it, a material? Um no, it, it it's not a material, but what it does is when the phosphorus is coming through there, the the aluminum salts bind to it like chemically uh -huh. so then the phosphorus cannot be used for anything else and it stays on that so it's not like a like a plastic blanket it's more of like a chemical barrier that doesn't a filter yeah exactly and then what happens it still goes but it's uh it's, it doesn't hurt anything yeah but then the, so, so then the phosphorus is held down in those sediments oh it sits yep and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it stays there oh uh, but over time that starts to wear out think of it like your fridge filter over over time, <laughs> like like you have a filter that's in your refrigerator with your water in the door. Over oh. time, that becomes clogged with some of the dissolved minerals that come through in the water, and you have to replace it. Okay. Well, that's where we are on Lake St. Clair now. Ah. The, the average life expectancy of an alum treatment is about 10 years. We're at about 13. Oh. So we had a really good life of it, but now it's starting to fail. So we're looking at... Um, replacing it. Replacing it, yeah. And 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 can you pull it out, or is it really nope, it's, chemicals? It's, it's just yep, you dump. Yep, it's new... either you 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 wouldn't be able to see it. It just it looks just like sediment. It's uh, oh, it's just a. Uh... It'll be the top, depending on how much is placed in there. The top eight to twelve inches of those sediments will have that alum mixed with it. So when the phosphorus comes through, it binds. So it's heavier it. than water, so it sinks on the bottom. Yeah. So when when you first do the treatment, you'll see the lake creates a flocculent, so it'll kind of foam up on the top, and then that settles out, and then it goes across the bottom. I, no, I really am fascinated because you have a <laughs> biology and a chemistry a minor and, and it really you're practicing chemistry in nature to mm -hmm. assisted perform. Yeah, so, so what, what we're trying to do is, is, is do slight manipulations to kind of help slow or stop um, you know, it's a natural process for the, you know, the phosphorus. You're not to hurting it, you're improve, like you're, yeah. you're assisting it, you're mm -hmm. supporting it. Yeah. Huh. So we have Sinclair and Sally and uh, yep. what else did we do? Did we, uh, um, what else? Well, the, um, for, if we're talking about projects that we did in the past, um, we were pretty active in the, well, if we go north in the district, let's go um, north of Floyd Lake, Campbell Creek area. Okay. There's an agricultural area up there with uh, row crops that are, you know, cultivated fields, uh, usually in soybeans or corn. Uh -huh. uh, we help get a lot of agricultural practices in there that help slow the stormwater and the sediment that gets into the lake. 
or not in the lake, into the river, and then eventually into yeah. Floyd Lake. So we used um, sediment control basins, which are a essentially a berm in a valley. So when the water comes off of the fields during a rain event, it'll get stopped by that berm. Mm -hmm. The water builds up temporarily, so the sediment can settle out of the water. Mm. And then there's an outlet pipe in the middle of that basin that would deliver the water from that basin directly to the river underground so you don't have the erosive water flow over the landscape interesting did i explain that i got okay, it okay okay yeah no i did um and, and then, then and because of, of the dam situation like something like the yep. sediment settles and yep. it's not carried further it, exactly so so what we're doing is we're creating with a sediment control basin a temporary stormwater pond so the the storm water that's coming through a valley would hit that dam or the berm Burn, yeah. the water would back up and create a small pond and when the water velocity coming over land meets that temporary water the velocity of the water slows down and when that slows down the sediment falls out that quickly yeah mm -hmm. and now it's not it, it, it's not going to stop everything yeah. but the larger particles uh it, de it definitely and they does. settle then they settle out um, kind of in that in that field there. Usually it's planted with native grasses. Uh -huh. um, that also helps kind of like as a filter, picks up some of the nutrients that kind of get settled out or filtered out in the in the sediment there. And then the water, there would be a, a vertical standpipe in the in the bottom of that sediment basin. And the water would enter that and then go ah. underground down to so, down ah, to the street. Okay. Kind mm -hmm. of kind of like a plug and a, and a top that it was okay and yep and it yep so then the water would, the would, would fall down from from the top yeah <laughs> okay interesting oh i'm, I'm um, so, so we're really active in, in yeah, supporting and what? those were put in in 2012 and 2013 oh just um, recent yeah so those are pretty recent and then i'm in the process of doing a, a a study along that river to monitor the effectiveness of their of those practices just to to see how good they're working. After three, four, five mm -hmm. years, we can actually have some statistics and some exactly. uh, results. Yeah, last and year and the year before were the first couple of years that we had real good data because they're becoming really established now because we have to kind of wait for that vegetation to really um, establish and get a hold. Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah wow. Um, how, how big is the group? Like how many people work in the Pelican Watershed District? Well, there's three of us. Three, okay. So it's um, me, the our administrator, Tara Getter, mm -hmm. and then our office man manager, Brenda Moses. Okay. So, so we're the people on the ground, but we're, we don't operate on our, on our own with whatever we want to do. We're directed by a board of managers. So we have seven managers that make the decisions of the direction and the practices that the watershed does with its activities. So we have representatives from most of the lakes and then um, some from the agricultural areas too. So these this board of directors, is it an elected? How do I become? They're, they're, they're appointed by the Becker County Board of Commissioners. Wow, this is really complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and they do this voluntarily or they, mm -hmm. they're not on a payroll, so they're no, just very they, connected. There's, there's, there, there's a small stipend or a reimbursement for, yeah, for okay. it's but it's bucks or something. Yeah, if, uh, yeah, about half of that, I think. Yeah, okay. But uh, no, it's, they're, they're, they're definitely not there to make money. No, no. Um, but so, uh, it's a, so it's, um, it's more of a volunteer, but you kind of get some of the expenses covered yeah. for travel. And, 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 and they want to be Okay, they're representing the best interest of the community, the best interest of nature in that way, yeah. in that sense. Yeah, so we have um, different regions of the watershed district that are represented with, with the board of managers. So we have, you know, uh, a manager from Lake Detroit, uh, one from Long Lake, one from the Sally Melissa Association, um, and then we have some from north in the agricultural area. So we, we, we try to get some people from every different type of environment or mm. area that we have in the watershed districts so we have good representation of, of the district as a whole and they deliver uh, um, the needs in a way yeah yeah so so they meet once a month and then the once a month. yep and then the district staff will kind of report on what we did last month and if there's any uh you know new projects and kind of inform them of, of what we've been doing and then they make decisions on on different projects that will that will be conducting so they have the so they are the ex no you're the executive and they are yep. kind of the yep they're kind of driving the bus interesting yeah oh, I didn't even know like highly organized yeah <laughs> like no, it's, yeah it it's is it's really is. organized so and they're appointed by the commissioners correct said. yep yep so when when there are vacancies they're posted um, and then people that are interested would 
express their interest with a, you know, a letter of interest or kind of like an application and submit. To the commission directly of Becker County. Correct. Yep. And then they would discuss and then the commissioners, do, you know, kind of dis do talk about what I just, what I just spoke on of the different yeah. regions and try to find someone to represent each of the interests that the watershed district has and then appoint someone that they feel is fit. Huh. Yeah. It's really fascinating. I didn't know how, how organized it is. And you cooperate with the Conrad um, uh, Watershed District? Uh, um, like you're in touch? You yeah, share experiences? Yeah, to a, to a degree. Um, our, they're not, they don't have as big of an office as, as we do. I mean, we have a, a pretty extensive water quality monitoring program that I run, a permitting program that, um, that I'm in charge of. They're, they have adopted the same rule set that we have. Um, but don't have the the water quality monitoring aspect of, of the district that they that have a smaller district is it kind of the same? Uh, um it's going to be similar in size but smaller in staff yeah okay mm -hmm. okay and uh, uh, and we we don't necessarily have a watershed district in each region so it is established like you said earlier by yeah by the so so one thing that um that, that I try to clarify is that every area is a watershed. Okay. Every area drains somewhere. Sure. So we're the Pelican River watershed, mm -hmm. and we happen to have a Pelican River watershed district, which is the organization that yeah. kind of operates or manages that this area. Um, then we're part of the Red River or the Otter Tail watershed, which is the larger um, drainage area, which drains into the Red River watershed. So, okay. so everybody, you know, on the face of the earth will be in a watershed. Sure. Um, and then within Minnesota, a watershed district would be an area that either had some impaired water issues or flooding issues. And then they were petitioned to the state to establish these legal boundaries to have this legal um, government organization help managing the, the water and the resources in that area. Okay. Cool. So um, before uh, we come to how to get a hold of you, um, if there's great interest, just I saw something at the NSU uh, landscape uh, department once, and uh, you know, uh, and most people know I'm not originally from here, but uh, there's Red River Valley, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and um, the Red River is the lowest point going north to to Winnipeg or towards Winnipeg. Yes. And um, everything feeds into this basin, right? It's kind of like a basin. And yeah. like we are also, we are at the bottom of a former glacier or something. Mm -hmm. No, we're not the bottom. Oh, lake. A lake, yeah. I'm sorry yep. about that. Uh, Agassiz, Lake yep. Agassiz. Yeah, that's that right. Part. I'm sorry, yeah. And uh, so everything triple, trickles down and eventually trickles down into the Red River? From in this, from in this area, yep, yep. So we feed Red River and work anyway. work um another one of the reasons i know i kind of backtrack a little bit that the watershed district was established is that we're considered a headwaters watershed so the pelican river watershed is at the top end of the larger otter tail river watershed and then the otter tail altitude we're higher or what do you mean um farther upstream oh so we're, we're like the farthest upstream so whatever we do in this area will our end up water in in the otter tail river and okay. then whatever happens in that otter tail will end up in the red ah so we're kind of um what we do <laughs> affects everybody. affects our neighbors downstream oh so sure. if we don't take care of our land use practices and take care of our water our water gets to you know the otter tail river and that flows through a whole chain of lakes south of us in otter tail county and then eventually that's into the red and even to our neighbors to the north in Canada when it gets to Lake Winnipeg. Yeah, so, yeah it has a chain reaction. Yeah, as so a... um, we try to be good neighbors and <laughs> to take care of our storm water so our well, neighbors don't to have know, to. Mm -hmm. I, I really think it's good to know that we actually are proactive yes. for 50 years considering our neighbors. That's mm -hmm. really a good working society. Uh, um, and I, I hope we will continue with that approach. And, and actually the uh, awareness for me as a resident, either, either as a weekender resident or like a permanent resident in the area, mm -hmm. that uh, I'm, I'm, it's kind of like throwing a pop can out of the window of a car. You better don't do that. Yep. Uh, uh, and like the same with me owning Lakeshore, whatever I do, may and if more people do it have it has a negative impact on yeah a, a, a public resource and that's the nice thing about minnesota is that the lakes aren't owned by anybody anybody can use the lake they're they're public so people that live on the lake get to use them but people that don't live on the lake have the same benefit of using these public resources and when you have 
private land or private property around the lake, what happens there can affect a public resource. So that's why we're so active in trying to take a proactive approach of managing and helping educate people to make wise land use decision. Um, we're not anti-development by any means. I mean, mm. it's it's important for the community to grow and thrive, to develop. We're just trying to help educate on responsible development ideas and practices that we can develop and grow our community while still protecting and preserving one of the reasons why our community is here for the public, re you know, for, the, so for the lakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. How do we get in touch with the Pelican River Watershed? Um, sure. Our office is in the Wells Fargo building here in Detroit Lakes. Yeah. Um, if uh, if you go to our website, it's prwd.org, so Pelican River Watershed District. So okay. prwd.org. And we'll share that on our website. Okay, yep. And then our, our numbers will be on there, my yep. contact information on what will be on there. So if you want to so give me a phone call at the office, send me an email. Um, and also more of what you do, your mission is, and, and how yeah, you Yeah, yeah. So then um, on there too, we'll, what, it'll show a little bit about what I do as far as research and water quality monitoring. Yep. So, you know, making sure that our lakes are maintaining at a good water quality level, aren't being degraded. And um, that's, that's the other part of our goal. So good. Anything you want to add? Um, well, it's construction season oh, and, yeah. ev and everyone's looking at um, improving their lake property. So if there are any questions or whether you know you need a permit or just aren't sure, or if you just have any, questions about what you should or shouldn't do or what you can do to, to help the lake not necessarily required to do but what you can do to help benefit um give me a call that's that's what i got into this uh in this line of work for and i really enjoy it uh, share your phone number just 218-846-0436 yeah super brand uh, alcott thank you very much for coming well, thank sharing. you much for having me i had a wonderful time yeah well, we, I hope we see you again, actually, like when there's updates. Uh, I really uh, like this educational component to what yeah, we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you'll have to have me back. We're, we're in the process of having a very large project go in, a $1.5 million wetland restoration project going in north of Detroit Lake. Wow. Um, that will hopefully start this fall. So okay. I just want to put a teaser out there yes, so, so, yes. so you get me back and I can talk about another another fun project we're working on. Uh, super. Thank you very um, much. And if anyone is interested on that Rice Lake restoration project, uh, we do have some links on our website too. So Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Well, thanks and have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Yeah, this was already our uh, newest episode of the Lake Life Weekend podcast. We sure... Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, tune in again next week with another great guest and updates. Always check out our website, uh, lakelifeweekend.com. And if you have some comments, please feel free to email us at hello at lakelifeweekend.com. And uh, you have a wonderful weekend ahead. <laughs>